Our next speaker is coming from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He is the Chief of Orthopedic Surgery. Please welcome Dr. Freddie Fu. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here at this meeting. I'm a surgeon, so I do not usually come to this meeting, but Dr. Sampson really uh, put on a very good, well-organized uh, meeting, and I'm learning a lot uh, myself. I want to share with you uh, what we have done in Pittsburgh in the last 60, 65 years. Maybe it can relate what you're doing today. Uh, disclosures. Now, I think we have to respect the past, to understand the past, so we can move forward, especially mistakes that we make. Now, I think that we try to avoid a total knee, and we try to do something to repair that damaged part, all of you are doing right here. So it may not happen today, and maybe one day it can happen. Our department is 100 plus years old, only five chair. So if you come to Pittsburgh, you are stuck there a little bit. Now I think that I want to talk to you about biological and biomechanics and some of the early and some of the more recent research we have done in cartilage. Now in the 50s, this gentleman, Thomas Brower, who uh, became chair at Kentucky to show that actually cartilage cells so <laughs> So by, by diffusion, because at the time, we did not understand how they live. There's no blood supply, no nerve supply. Henry Mencken, still alive right now in the 80s, professor at Harvard, but when he was in Pittsburgh, he actually showed the cartridge cells, the control cells are active. We thought it's a not active structure. They showed there's mitosis, and in fact, I would think that it's most like a heart. It's like a organ, very active structure. Imagine, you pound this millions of times a day, and it survives, and sometimes it's a problem. So it's really active living structure, like the heart. Now, also in the 1950s, this gentleman, Han, who's an alumni at Pitt, when he was in Mayo Clinic, won the Nobel Prize by steroids, treating rheumatoid arthritis. So it seemed to be a great thing to use. And of course, we start injecting steroids into the knees. And Dr. Mankin, actually, from our lab, showed that actually the steroids, although give you symptomatic relief, but actually will decrease the proclinic glycan secretion on the control sites. So it doesn't really solve the basic problem, solve the symptoms. So I want to ask all of you what we're treating today, the symptoms of the basic pathology. Now, this is a you know, incredible work done in the 60s, 70s that people do not realize. In fact, I think these two gentlemen should be nominated for Nobel Prize. Bentley from London, from England actually, from Oxford, and Greer, they all come to our lab. At that time, they took cells, cartridge cells, grow in culture, and put it in the defect in rabbits. Bingo, it forms. It's, it's, it's 1971 in nature. <laughs> There's no propagation in nature in orthopedics. So this is uh, really the beginning of cell therapy, all those things beginning. And Dr. Green in our lab also sh showed that in order for the control sites to become control sites, you need a three-dimensional matrix to make it happen. Just like all of you like to live in a bigger house, more room to run around than living on a you know, flat bed. Okay, this is exactly what happened. So the orders work is now being used today to really grow cartilage cells, put matrix in. And this is the, you know, the Swedish technique in exactly 25 years later. So I would say that these are the really pioneers in tissue engineering. By, by the way, the term was founded in 1988 by Van Mao from Columbia University. So these people are 20 years ahead. <laughs> Even they then the name, and now you, today you're talking about tissue engineering. Now, I want to put this link together. How do we link biological to orthopedics and maybe to your world? And it comes from wear particles. Wear particles, okay? How does it come? Now, Chris Evans, who's now in Mayo Clinic, he's, he actually he started with me in the lab back in 1977. With Dr. Mears, who is a 
Oxford, Cambridge, MD, PhD. His father is the chief scientific officer of US Steel. He knew a lot about wear particles. So he thinks that wear is our problem. Looking at wear in the knees, sticking needles into many people, including myself, and see what happened. See all those part particles in there. But it's hard to make a correlation. What happened to these wear particles? Okay, until something came along. New thing doesn't mean it's always good. But if, if something, complication happened, we learn something. So in the 80s, we like to put artificial ligament in the knee. You are probably too young to know about it. I put about 50 cortex in the knee. And with a rupture, my God, it's wear particles everywhere. <laughs> now we did a study that showed us wear particles. In there the synovium. Synovium will secrete all the cytokines and destroy the whole damn knee. Okay, this is why you're dealing with PRP and stem cells today. We study all those things very carefully, very carefully. And, uh, and with that idea, Chris Evans and Paul Robbins was able to be the first in the world in orthopedic to use gene therapy to put those viral vectors with IREC, you know, uh, you know, into the cells of control sites and suppress the secretion of cytokines. And this is what you are doing today with injection, except this is much more sophisticated. It costs much more money to do, all right? So you have to understand your, your limitation where you are today, you know, with this kind of idea. In fact, we have the first trial in gene therapy in Pittsburgh in the front page of New York Times, uh, right here in, two, in, uh, in the 90s, except that we have a problem in gene therapy because of complications occurs, like you're gonna see today, the complication from stem cells, from PRP2, maybe. And with that, most of the gene therapy gets shut down, and not until this year, last year, the Korean, bring this back, and now there's the first commercial available of gene therapy for arthritis in the world from Korea right now. So it takes 30 years, ladies and gentlemen, to get where you are. I know that you're talking about 15 years, maybe 10 to 20 years, it may be, take a long time. Maybe, maybe you're too impatient to wait. Now, in order to improve healthcare, there are three things. This is called the, you know, the triad that we use evidence-based medicine from uh, Gordon Kayet from McMaster. Individual clinical expertise, like I'm the expert, the patient expectation, it works, and then the best clinical evidence. But in order for us to do it fast and have a faster return, you find a famous doctor, surgeons or other doctors, the famous players, and a new treatment. Now this is actually one of the kind of uh, treatment. Now Peter Willing was a fellow in the 80s in a lab. So he knows everything about you know, the cytokines in IREC. So he went back to Germany and started this company who concentrated IREC to really suppress inflammation. And he injected to many people like Kobe Bryant and other people. And in fact, you heard about it over the world. They come, you know, uh, they, even the Pope had it done. And he, he essentially wrote an article to say that it's effective after two years. Now, but unfortunately, you need other people to confirm it. So Daniel Saris, who's now in Mayo Clinic, but he was in Amsterdam before, he actually showed that there's not much effect in two, up to two weeks only effect. And he now have a 10 years follow up just published. And essentially, this particular technique is not very effective. So again, you need other people to confirm your study. I cannot tell you Freddy Fu is the best surgeon in the world. Someone has to report what I'm doing to see how good I am. Just like uh, the other speaker have said, why almost everything you hear about medicine is wrong? Because we want to give you positive results. Get published quickly. But negative results usually take a long time to be published. Five, ten years to be published. Okay? Now let's go to biomechanics. Now, I know you are more biological. You do PRP stem cells, but it goes hands in hands. If you have good biology and poor biomechanics, it will not work. For example, back in the early 80s, Dr. Barris, who's a hand surgeon now, and I did some study to show that if you take the meniscus, you're going to increase contact pressure and decrease contact stress. 
Okay, so, so it's a bad thing. In, in, remember in the 70s, 80s, we like to take out the meniscus all the time. But now we repair it if we can. We also showed that the meniscus is uh, very mobile. Now, this MI was done in 1988 when the MI came out. <laughs> in fact, even 30 years later, this is a pretty good MI to show how mobile the meniscus are. I'm just telling you, all the, all the structures are not static. They are very active structures, like the heart. Think everything in the body is like a heart. Then you'll be a better you know, researcher, OK? Because the heart surgeon, a big deal. It takes a lot of money to do that, OK? Now, I went to Sweden to learn this Swedish technique. And when I was in Sweden, I saw Lars Peterson. He did this meniscus, not meniscus, the cartilage transplant without meniscus transplant. And I told him, it won't work. You need both to make it work. And this is a dancer, actually. I operated on in Pittsburgh. That was 25 years ago. I just put a meniscus transplant in, and the cartilage grow back. You can see on the slides, the cartilage actually regrow itself without any other intervention. It goes hand in hand. Not every case is like that, but they work together. Now, in Pittsburgh, we have all kinds of facilities, like robot. We can look at six degree of freedom, how all this cadaver part moves. We have all this biodynamic lab to so actually intraticular you know, motion of all the joints and can measure contact pressure. For example, the A cell. Traditionally, we think the A cell will turn at 8% of stretching. In cadaverous, dead one, which is in room temperature. But in real life, the A cell stretch 20%. It doesn't rupture. <laughs> and every day you need stem cells, you need all those things to replenish. And this is why the A cell was healing power is there, have to be there every day. By the way, this is a picture of George Washington and the Indian chief speaking in Pittsburgh 260 years ago. Hopefully, Trump will do well, you know, in Singapore too. <laughs> now, what is incidental stem cell discovery? 25 years ago, we hired Johnny Hewitt to try to cure muscular dystrophy. So in the cost of growing muscle cells, he find that 1% of the cells don't die, even for muscular dystrophy people, 1%. So we study it, and we submit it to a journal, good journal, and the editor wrote up, these are uh, stem cells you discover, by the way. <laughs> you should change the name to stem cells. So many studies has been done over the years. In fact, he just won the Kappa Delta Award, which is the Nobel Prize of orthopedic this year. So it takes a long time for discussion. Now, you can ask me, how come we discover the muscle stem cells in the lab? In fact, we're the first orthopedic department to have their own stem cells line. How come I don't use it? Because we see problems. Young people with stem cells can be a problem. We see in culture, some of those stem cells become tumor cells in cultures, for example. I don't want to put some tumor cells into some young people. <laughs> so where does it go? So actually, we know that stem cell, for example, can really help the cartilage healing with a BMP and other things. But it costs a lot of money. But we find out actually in use, in, in use in actually practically, the urologists are the ones who use it. Because in, in women, when you get older, your splinter of the bladder get loose. And surgery is very difficult, plus not reliable. So we use the stem cell to inject into the splinter and now 85% successful. And we actually, Coke company, collaborate with us, and Coke Myosite is formed 20 years ago, and now it's a $100 million investment, 130 employees in Pittsburgh. In fact, we are the, you know, almost department-wise, we have created the most jobs in the whole Pittsburgh from one department. The Gowan have 500 jobs created, but we're 130. So it's just reopened with John Hewitt just last summer. So again, you don't really always get what you want. The Rolling Stones, remember. But you may get what it works, OK? This is what it's all about. OK, I need to advance. So I cannot advance. Sorry. Oh, now this is Connie Chu. Now it's Stanford. But in Pittsburgh, he also looked at way how to do early diagnosis of OA with, with infrared, for example, system. And Rocky Tron. And Carlos Lorenzen, who was at, you know, I uh, had uh, you, uh, uh, at Jefferson at that time, and then come to Pittsburgh to use technology to look at scaphoids. 
Now, Rocky Chuan is a rock star. He gets so much grants, and now he is the chancellor of the Chinese University of Hong Kong, but he still maintains a lab in our department. And he kept this chip on the John, which is incredible. So he can now study many things, biologically and biomechanic, with this model he created. In fact, he took this chip on the John to space. He is the only orthopedic researcher I know that have a lab in NASA to look at what happened without weight, what happened to your cartilage, for example. Nobody has studied that. So. Now, lastly, I want to tell you variation. Am I Jackie Chan, ladies and gentlemen? I'm not, okay? Okay, we we'll look at all these animals, all these things. Look at all those things and uh, tigers, and then we find out actually there's so many variations in morphology in human and gorilla, and they move differently. And also, humans move differently too, okay? Look at that, all this dissection, and biologically, even more variation than, than, than morphological, I'm telling you. So if you, I'm, I'm an ACL surgeon, for example. I do many ACL surgery. So at one time, we focus on ACL. Just do the ACL. But actually, the whole picture is not ACL. It's a whole, whole morphology. It's a whole organ. If you miss the whole morphology of the bone that, that makes it, you're going to miss the whole damn thing. This is why we have no improvement in 30 years. It's the same thing. We have to look at the whole bone morphology. And same for you people in biological. There are many things happening. For example, why is the cartilage in the knee thicker than the one in the ankle? You think the ankle is smaller. The cartilage should be thicker. But it's not. It's smaller. <laughs> it's thinner. Okay? We don't understand why, okay, for example. Look at that. This is knee, and this is, you know, in, in, in ank you know, ankle. And also, variable biological response. So if you inject marcaine, for example, into, into the cartilage, in, um, they, sometimes they can cut chondrolysis in some patient. And uh, we do it in the lab, too. So it's essentially, some patient will reject to marcaine with a negative effect. We do not want to know which one. So when you inject something into the people, same way. You do not know who is going to have negative results, OK? You do not know what the environment when you inject it in. You do not know the quality of thing you're going to inject into. All right, advance. OK, so lastly, conclude. Medicine is an art. It's based on principle. You have to be critical of yourselves. You have to have objective outcome measurement. And the latest is not the greatest. I have seen the probably 50 thing comes and go. It doesn't quite work, you know, out. Oh, go back one. So this is from Jim Kim, who is, uh, I know him personally because uh, I was on the board at Dartmouth College Medical School. Uh, he was the president, but now he's World Bank president. So he said, we're making the same mistake in global healthcare we make in the American system. Believing that better diagnosis and therapeutic tools will solve our problem. They won't. They have not. We don't under measure results well enough. So until you measure the outcome, you won't get there. You understand? Until you know how much money in your wallet, you're not going to get more money. Same idea. So in, the, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, innovation is necessary for continued advances in healthcare. However, innovations need to be supported by evidence, both basic science and clinical, and not market-driven. Progress in healthcare requires publication of both positive and negative results, and positive findings should be independently verified. Thank you very much.